Welcome into College Football Smothered and Covered, episode seven of the show. Already have had a fantastic response from viewers and listeners out there. So I encourage you to share the show, subscribe everywhere you possibly can. We are on YouTube, we are on Rumble, then we have the audio version on Apple, Spotify, Google, wherever you get your podcast. It is Friday, going to play a little golf later on this afternoon, hence the golf get up. But we do have a busy show before that. We will talk about Kirk Kerbstreet and Dylan Ray Dylan Rayola, the kerfuffle that has gone down over the course of the last 24 hours. We'll talk also about Ryan Grubb, Nick Saban, and a political tweet that us as college football fans can all get behind because, as we all know, burning Iowa's offense goes beyond the left and to you by Coastal Vibe Vacations, 850-888-0515, coastalvibevacations.com. A great place to schedule a vacation with the entire family this summer. One bedroom, two bedroom, three bedroom condos on Okaloosa Island, just between Destin and Fort Walton Beach, about a five, 10 minute drive west of the heart of Destin, whether it be fine restaurants, family fun in the sun, or just a romantic getaway, Coastal Vibe Vacations will have you covered. 850-888-0515 or CoastalVibeVacations.com. All right, Georgia fans all up in arms because news broke a couple days ago that ESPN personality Kirk Herbstreet steered five-star quarterback Dylan Rayola away from Georgia. He was a Georgia commit to Matt Rule and the Nebraska Cornhuskers. I would say the biggest signee that Nebraska has received ever in terms of uh, star rankings, but, you know, in terms of on-field impact, that remains to be seen. But when you look at this situation, I'm friends with Kirk Herbstreit. He's a great dude. And I'm trying to take my personal feelings towards him out of this because when you when you look when you talk to Kirk he he only cares about the game he cares about the game and you know Ohio State fans have have used him as you know their their mouthpiece and Michigan fans hate him in the past and it seems like everybody has had a love-hate relationship with with Kirk at, at one point based on what he's saying this is not a big deal Georgia fans it's not a big deal that Kirk Herbstreet was asked advice by his friend and discussed the future of Dylan Rayola with a guy who has a relationship. Now, let's go back a little bit. Dominic Rayola and Kirk Herbstreet are friends. They have a personal relationship, right? And Dominic talks to Kirk about the possibility that Dylan could flip. From Georgia to Nebraska. Cool. That happens all the time. And according to Dominic, Kirk said, dude, this is true. You got to do it. He got to do it. Now, Kirk went on Paul Feinbaum's show on Thursday and said, of course, I did not try to sell Nebraska or tell anybody not to go to Georgia. That's the most ridiculous thing that anybody would try to do. I did compliment Matt Rule. If I'm guilty of anything, it's that I said Matt Rule is a good coach and he's a good man, and I believe he will bring Nebraska back the way he did with Temple and Baylor. What's the problem? What's the problem? I like Matt Rule, too. I think he's a phenomenal, phenomenal head coach. And I think more importantly, a phenomenal man. Now, full discretion, my wife is a travel agent. Totally unrelated from Coastal Vibe Vacations, which sponsors this show. But she planned Matt Rule's Disney trip last year. Maybe it was a couple of years ago. Matt's a great dude. And I agree with Kurt. And if somebody asked me, hey, you know what? My kid's thinking about going to Nebraska. What do you think of Nebraska? I'd say the same exact thing that Kurt Kerbstreet said. Does it mean I hate Georgia? No. Does it mean... 
I'm out to get Kirby Smart? No. Does it mean anything other than me discussing the sport of college football with a person that I have a relationship with? No, that's all it means. That's all it means. If you think that Kirk Herbstreet can dictate a decision of an 18-year-old, 17, 18-year-old young man based on what he thinks of a program and its coach, you are out of your freaking mind. You're crazy. That's not how any of this works. Look, I, I live in Metro Atlanta, right? There are high school, you throw a rock outside my door, you'll hit five stars all over the place, right? And a lot of them have lived in my neighborhoods. I've lived in massive neighborhoods. Like the neighborhood I live in right now has over a thousand homes. And there are some really good dudes. Actually, two guys who signed with North Carolina last year. A couple of the side with Georgia. Not only in this neighborhood, but in the one I lived in in the past. And I have relationships with their parents. I have relationships with them. And if they were to come to me and say, hey, what do you think of this team? What do you think of that team? Do you like this coach? Yeah. No. I hate him. I love him. Whatever. That's a conversation you have personally. So if Kurt, if Kirk Herbstreit told Dominic that he likes Matt Rule, so what? What's the problem? Georgia fans, I love you. There are a lot of you around. There are, there's one right there next door. That way, actually, next door. I don't know if he's upset about this. You shouldn't be. But chill TF out. Dylan's not with you. You know who is? Carson Beck. You know who will be? Gunnar Stockton. You know who will be after him? Or even with him? Five-star quarterback X that's coming in through the transfer portal or through high school recruiting. It will be fine. So I, I just, it these type of things for people in our industry are frustrating. Because, and I, I know this especially with Kirk, because he is my friend. And I feel the same way too. All I care about is the sport. All I care about is the sport. I want the sport to be healthy. And you know what's healthy for the sport? Dylan Raiola going to Nebraska, bringing Nebraska back. You know what's all the, also healthy for the sport? Dylan Raiola going to Georgia. And continuing the line of excellent teams in Georgia. Both of those things are good for the sport. And that's all we care about. That's all I care about. And trust me, with my personal relationship with Kirk, and that's all he cares about, too. So it's just an off-season storyline. It's just something to yell about. People love to think that people in our industry are biased one way or the other. No, it's not the case. It really isn't. All we want is a sport to be healthy. And that's all Kirk was saying here. And he had a personal relationship with Matt Rule. Matt Rule's a great guy. He is. Doesn't mean I'm out to get anybody, but it's the truth. All right, speaking of ESPN personalities, Nick Saban is now an ESPN personality. And again, people are all up, all up in arms. I mean, look, I think Nick Saban is going to be phenomenal at this job. I think he is going to be fantastic. We've seen him do this in guest appearances. We saw it two years ago when Georgia played TCU in the national championship game where David Pollack infamously said with Nick Saban on set that Georgia is the class of college football right now and Alabama isn't. The truth of the matter is that was accurate at the time. And Nick handled it professionally and did a good job. But it's not the only time he's, do he's done this. He did it back when Auburn played in the national championship against Oregon. I think he was at the Florida State-Auburn game as well. I think he was at the LSU-Clemson game too. He's good at this. And I can't wait to hear it because – Nick, when you get him out of football mode, is actually really good. He's a really good dude, and he's very entertained. The problem is 99% of the time when he was an actual football coach, he was in football mode. But I, I'm really fascinated to hear his thoughts on the current state of the game. We're talking about the best coach in college football history. Going on set on the ultimate and most visible not just television show, but PR mouthpiece of our sport. And look, I, I don't watch game day all the time. In fact, I don't even get to watch game day that much because I'm a father of two. I've got 
baseball in the fall. I've got AU softball for girls in the fall. I stay up until two in the morning. So I sometimes just want to get away from football in the morning to get my mind right for 14 straight hours. So I don't watch game day all the time. It's a good show. I love the show. Usually catch the end when Corso makes his picks, whatever. But think about how many casual fans will tune in. How many random non-college football fans, NFL fans, Major League Baseball fans, soccer fans will gravitate towards the sport knowing that the greatest football coach of all time is on the sport's greatest mouthpiece, and that is college game day. It's good for our sport. It really is. So, look, if you don't like Saban, if you think Saban's going to be biased against your team, okay, give the dude a chance on TV. I can guarantee you that he will be as much of a neutral party as you possibly can be. Because what's one thing that we know about Nick Saban that he's done off the field that has been apparent since the moment he was hired by LSU, I'm not saying Michigan State, LSU, because he won a national championship there, and that's when he made a name for himself, is that he's always been out for what is best for the sport, kind of like Kirk Herbstreet. Nick was at the forefront of what we called the plus one system back in the late 2000s, which ended up being the college football playoff, the 14 college football playoff. He's always been for nine conference games. Well, not always, because now there's some issues with it. But a uh, long, long time ago, he was for the nine team, uh, nine game, I should say, SEC schedule. And he's also said multiple times and been on this for a long time that he only wants power five opponents. And then when the SEC and went 10 straight games, went only conference games in the COVID year, he's all for it. He loved it. Now, granted, he won a national championship, so that would obviously – have something to do with it, but he was all for it beforehand. So uh, Nick on TV is going to be fine. I can't wait to see it. Now, let's talk about his former employer. There have been, and I'm sipping some coffee right now because it is the morning and I'm going to play golf here in a minute, and I got to be all juiced up for that. Alabama, as of 9.30 a.m. Eastern time on Friday, has not officially announced the hiring of Ryan Grubb as their offensive coordinator. <clears throat> that has been, I wouldn't say a point of contention, but maybe just some slight concern of Alabama fans over the last month, ever, ever since Ryan, uh, <clears throat> I should say, Kalen DeBoer was hired. Because he is their offensive coordinator, and he went out on the Yay Alabama um, National Signing Day party. And he said, which I don't necessarily think was a shock, but he said, and this is from the next round live, I'm Ryan Grubb. I'm your new offensive coordinator. And that was, I think it sounded like a definitive statement. Right? It was. It is. I'm not necessarily sure we should take it as a statement of fact of the future, but it's a statement of fact at the time. He is their offensive coordinator. He has been hired. Everybody knows it. High school recruits know it. Players in the roster know it. Transfer players know it. He is their offensive coordinator. That was the first time he's been able to speak. And honestly, I was shocked that he was allowed to speak at all. And it was a refreshingly shocked because <clears throat> when Nick Saban was there, assistants couldn't speak except when they were contractually required, which was at a bowl game, playoff game, regular bowl game, whatever. And then Nick's, tr Nick trotted them out in August as, as fall camp started. The fact that Grubb went out there at all is like, wow, this is going to be cool. I love this. But it's a statement of fact. He is their offensive coordinator. Now, the concern was that maybe he'd go to the Seattle Seahawks. He's never been an NFL coach, but maybe he'll go to the Seattle Seahawks. Never been an NFL coach, but... Obviously, he was in Seattle with Kalen DeBoer. He's been with Kalen DeBoer all the way back to Sioux Falls. Branching out and making a name for yourself might not be a bad idea when Kalen DeBoer's offense is generally regard regarded by scouts, and I've talked to scouts about this, as one of, if not the best offense in terms of preparation for the next level. So if you're Ryan Grubb, 
you might want to make a name for yourself in a different way. So I understand the attraction of the NFL. I understand the attraction of anywhere getting out of Kalen DeBoer's shadow because it's probably a quicker path to a head coaching job. But there still might be openings that attract him, that are intriguing to him. So, yeah, Alabama fans, I know you're happy. Ryan Grubb said he's staying. That is as close to the finish line as you can possibly be in a sort of saga that has fallen under the radar, flown under the radar, I should say. So, good. That's If he stays, you got a good one. If he stays, you got a flat-out dude. Your offense is going to be phenomenal. If he leaves, you have Kalen DeBoer. I mean, you have Kalen DeBoer. The guy's a winner. He's won with offense. That's his bread and butter. And you hired him for a reason. Because you trust him. Because you trust him to make the right decision from a personnel perspective, from a staff perspective, and from a game management perspective. Because he's done all of those very, very well. So I'm not saying your offensive coordinator position is useless, but you have somebody who you should trust to fix it. You have somebody who you trust, who you should trust to make things right when life throws you a curveball or two. You'll be fine. All right, last thing before I head out to the golf course. I'm not, this isn't, I'm not political. I, well, I, I have my political beliefs. This has nothing to do with them. All right. I am not political in terms of what I'm about to say. Italics, asterisk, bold words. That is what this is about. It is not about politics. It is about humor. Holy crap. House judiciary, judiciary GOP. This is a flat-out banger from last night. Now, for those who didn't watch, Joe Biden came out and talked about his mental acuity, and it did not go well because he called the president of, of Egypt the president of Mexico and yelled at people, whatever. It was bad. I think both sides of the aisle, anybody with a brain could see that it did not go well. House Judiciary, Judiciary I can't say that word today, GOP, Joe Biden to his staff, we need to go on offense tonight. and. The committee puts out a tweet saying the offense, and is it a picture of Iowa's offense? Oh, good Lord. That is so disrespectful to Iowa's offense. And now, granted, this is not this year. Spencer Petras is on there as a quarterback, and he actually had a tweet like, dude, why am I getting dragged into this? Why am I catching strays? But that is an absolute banger of a tweet. And... I urge you, if you have not looked at this tweet, go back and find it and read the replies. Because when I read the replies, I'm like, man, nothing unifies our country more than college football. Because I don't care what side of the aisle these guys were on. These people replying, whether Republican, Democrat, left, right, Green Party, No Labels Party, Independent, Brown Party yellow party, green party, whatever, birthday party, keg party. I don't care. Every single person on there is like, wow, this is great. And so many of them are like, I hate that the GOP made this point, but this is a good tweet. This is a really good tweet. And it is, it is. Nothing unifies us more than hating Iowa's offense. Brian Ferentz, this is how bad you get. This is how bad that offense has become. Now, granted, he's not there anymore. You are unifying the country, the heated political aspects of our country, because your offense was that bad. Can you imagine what it would have been like last year if Iowa's offense was just awful? Not, not if it was just awful. Like, talking... Okay, one one of the worst offense, a top one hundred offense, like maybe towards the back of the nine, like the hundreds, like 90, 85. If it was just awful, not horrendous, laughable, 
the butt of every joke. If it could just be one step up from there, Iowa could have made the playoff. I'm not even joking. They could have made that defense was unreal last year. But it got me thinking last night. This tweet got me thinking. Well, it got me thinking about a lot of things first because I still giggle every time I see it. But that was Iowa's last best chance. The 2023 season was Iowa's last best chance because I don't care that Brian Ferentz is there. Kirk Ferentz is. And his MO, his method of operation is still stuck in the 1990s. Play the defense, win the field position battle, and go old school. That still doesn't work, right? You had the best defense in the country. You're the best defense the world has ever seen. And you didn't do that. Now, granted, you made the Big Ten championship game, but that did not go well. But with USC, UCLA, Washington, and Oregon jumping in, with divisions being eliminated, now you don't have the Big Ten West to fall back on. Now you don't have one of the worst divisions in Power Five to win, to get to a conference championship game. You don't have that anymore. So what is Iowa? If Iowa is a top six team in the Big Ten, the new look Big Ten, I'd be floored. Iowa's not going to contend for a Big Ten championship at any point in the near future. At any point in the near future. If ever in the current landscape. That was their last best chance. And look how it ended. The GOP is going after you. And everybody in the country, no matter what side of the political aisle you are on, has come together to make fun of you, to laugh at it. what objectively was one of the funniest jokes, one of the funniest tweets I've seen in a long time. In fact, I was sitting there <laughs> Watching TV. Well, my wife is watching her show. She's watching The Chosen. And I'm sitting there just kind of scrolling through Twitter. And I just burst out laughing. She looks at me. She goes, what the hell's wrong with you? I'm like, oh, you got to see this. Because she understands. Like, she's married to a guy who covers college football. She understands a little bit about the, you know, what's going on. And she looked at it and she was like, oh, my God. It is incredible. So congratulations, Iowa's offense. You have done something that not many people can. And that is unite the country on both sides of the aisle. That'll do it for this edition of College Football Smothered and Covered. I really appreciate you checking out the show. Uh, this is the first full week we've done it. We're still going to go live on YouTube and Rumble. Don't know exactly what time yet still. Working on what works best, what doesn't work best. Working on anal seeing analytics, looking at analytics, deep dive into all that stuff. But it will be live on YouTube and Rumble every single day. Uh, just I'll let you know when the time is settled upon but you can also catch the audio version apple spotify google where you know whatever it is amazon podcast it'll always be there it'll be up there about an hour after the live show finishes up happy friday everybody have a great weekend and we will talk to you on monday